So I made two recent videos arguing the case for the rarity of complex life and intelligent life in the universe. I had one more in mind about the role of chance developments in the evolution of life on Earth. But I started to get a little uncomfortable, as if it were important to address the other side. The case for intelligent life being, if not common, then perhaps not necessarily so rare either. This doesn't negate any of the points I made in those recent videos arguing that intelligent life is probably rare, but I know that if I were watching those videos, I would want to argue with myself. I would have pointed out a number of limitations in my view, and before someone does that in the comments, I thought I'd just make this one and then I could say, well, just go watch this video first and then we'll see what there's left to debate. So I'm going to keep this focused for brevity and efficiency and say that there are two main problems I see with the case that I made for the rarity of complex life. The first is that there is no direct evidence for or against life outside of Earth. It is a true and fair point that it took 87% of the maximum possible duration of Earth's biosphere before intelligent life like human beings evolved on the planet. The evolution and emergence of eukaryotic cells, which are the building blocks of all complex life on Earth, happened roughly two billion years ago. So let's say it took half the lifetime of the biosphere to get the most basic kind of cell that would go on to comprise the structure of all complex life on Earth. But with one data point only, that of life on Earth, we can really draw no reliable conclusion. Perhaps things happen differently elsewhere. Perhaps things frequently happen differently elsewhere. Is the process of the development of life on Earth typical, or is it very unusual? In the absence of this knowledge, we are essentially using educated guesses to speculate on matters that have actual empirical answers to which we are not yet privy. The second difficulty with the case I made against the prevalence of intelligent life is more abstract. Do we really understand what life is? We can characterize what we think of as life based on what we see and call life on Earth. Early in school kids are taught descriptive definitions of life. Life displays homeostasis, managing the conditions of an internal environment, one that is segregated from an external environment. Life is engaged in metabolism, using energy to power the biological processes necessary for life. It can reproduce. The genome can be seen as a way of conserving information, the coded information necessary for the survival of life in its environment, and for transmitting that information to progeny. It's the set of instructions for survival, for existence. These are descriptions of aspects of life on Earth. It's a matter of interesting debate as to which of these are necessarily part of life everywhere, and in every form it might take. Some argue that the storage and conservation of information is the essential nature of life. Since I was quite young, I've always seen the self-awareness of human beings as the way the universe has been able to reflect on itself through the part of the universe that is us. And this has always felt to me like one of the deepest meanings of intelligent life's existence. Others believe that energy flows are the essential thing about life. But even so, what is life? This is not a resolved matter. When we have more examples of life, examples not from our own planet, we will understand something about what is really basic to life. I mean this both in terms of what strategies life has used to thrive and survive elsewhere. But I also mean that when we have other examples, then I think we'll be able to start to understand more about what life really is, in ways about which we can only speculate now. As to the strategies for life elsewhere, we have no reason to think that DNA and RNA are the only chemical approaches to storing information or recording the instructions for life. They're just the ones that developed here on Earth. How many divergent chemistries are possible elsewhere? Nobody knows how many information storage systems are possible. And think about this. The number of unique small molecules 
in the size range of amino acids. Less than 500 Daltons, which is roughly the size of two amino acids. Amino acids, which are the constituent molecules of proteins, which themselves are the major structural elements of all cells on Earth. Or spoken of another way, the number of small molecules usable more broadly to generate complex molecules perhaps usable by life. An estimate of the number of possible small molecules, I link to this in the description, is 10 to the 60th power, an astronomical number. The Chemical Abstract Society, CAS, maintains a registry of molecules on Earth, and their estimate of the number of unique small molecules, those 500 Daltons or, or less, on Earth is just over 61 million, or 10 to the 8th power. So the number of possible small molecules in the universe dwarfs by a factor of 1 with 52 zeros after it the number of such molecules on Earth. As one way of thinking about the magnitude of possible alternate chemistries. If you're interested, you would call that number by which the estimated total number of possible small molecules exceeds the number of such molecules on Earth 10 sextillion, a number few of us have even heard of, let alone dealt with. So the potential alternative chemistries outside of Earth are essentially impossible to reckon with. And I mentioned this whole topic of the number of possible small molecules as indicative of but one of who knows how many alternate strategies upon which life elsewhere could rest. And then we come to an even harder question, which is to wonder about the limits of our capacity to even wonder about intelligent life elsewhere, when we can't even agree or reliably understand what life is on Earth, let alone what it might mean elsewhere without the constraints and circumstances determined by our own planet. This is a much larger topic than I can cover here, but scientists have argued and debated and been frustrated by trying to understand what life is for a very long time with the modern version of that debate, perhaps stimulated by Schrodinger's 1944 book, What is Life? Some argue that if life exists elsewhere, it will probably be somewhat similar to life on Earth, because the laws of physics are the same, and the elements available for the formation of life are also the same. I made this argument myself in the first video I ever made, Why There Is Life on Other Planets, Probably. But other people differ. Carol Cleland stirred up the field by effectively pointing out that, quote, life is not the sort of thing that can be successfully defined. In truth, a definition of life is more likely to hinder than facilitate the discover of novel forms of life. All the more important a consideration when dealing not with earthbound life forms, but with potentially new and different forms of life elsewhere. Still others are dealing with a concept called assembly theory, which to oversimplify argues that life tends to be more complex than non-life, and it focuses on the likelihood that something is life based on how complex a given object is based on the number of its component elements. Chemist Lee Cronin has done original work in this field, and he says, quote, our system is the first falsifiable hypothesis for life detection and is based on the idea that only living systems can produce complex molecules that could not form randomly in any abundance, and this allows us to sidestep the problem of the definition of life." Unquote. Astrobiologist Sarah Walker, whose work I love and whose Twitter account you might want to follow because it's wonderful, argues that there's a distinction between life and alive. To quote her, alive is the systems that are actually constructing things. They're the ones doing the information processing to actually build those things. But I think a computer is life, or a screwdriver is life. Those things literally would not be created without information. So she's arguing that, to quote her again, there isn't really the hard line we might think between life and non-life. In my mind, life is a dynamical process, and it's one where you have particular information patterns that are structuring physical systems across space and time. And that's what life is. So you can't draw a hard boundary around that process. 
Unquote. So I mention these ideas to dance lightly around a vast terrain of challenges and issues, suggesting that raising the question of life elsewhere in the universe serves to highlight the impossibility of generalizing from one example, that of life on Earth, and that the range of potential strategies for life outside of Earth is something that we can't effectively grapple with using our current knowledge, but it's probably huge, and that when we ask ourselves, is there life elsewhere in the universe, we would do well to consider the unknowns and the fuzziness in our conception of what life really is. Putting together these ideas suggests tremendous limitations in our common sense thinking about extraterrestrial complex life. My own intuition is that understanding how limited our concepts are of what life is opens up immense possibilities for the variety and nature of life in the universe. Be sure to subscribe, hit the notification button, and thanks a lot for watching.